Does Harvard say fluoride will make you dumb? Whenever you go into the comments section of anything to do with fluoride and its influence on health, you will see people claiming that Harvard University says that fluoride in the drinking water is bad for you. So, is that really true? Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm R. Today, we will be discussing the study on fluoride ingestion and its influence on IQ conducted by academics who worked at Harvard. Let's get to it. So, the study entitled Developmental Fluoride Neurotoxicity, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, was published in 2012 by academics including some of whom worked at Harvard University in the journal Environmental Health Perspectives. This study is commonly referenced by anti-fluoride activists as evidence that the fluoride practices of many modern societies is resulting in negative health effects on the population. The paper is a meta-analysis of 27 epidemiological studies investigating the effects of fluoride on intelligence quotient, or IQ. The study finds a standardized weight of mean difference of 0.45, which would amount to a drop of around 7 IQ points. So this shows that fluoride in your drinking water will negatively influence your IQ, right? Well, not necessarily. There are a myriad of problems with this paper, but even if we ignore all of them, there is one simple point that has to be made. The paper itself doesn't claim the amount of fluoride in Western civilization's water will influence IQ. People who try to use the paper for this purpose are trying to hammer in a nail with a screwdriver. The paper examines 25 studies from China and two from Iran and looks at areas with high fluoride intake that starts at about 3 mg per litre of water and the highest at about 11.5 mg per litre of water. However, the ranges of fluoride in Western civilization's water is almost always under 1 mg per litre of water. The paper itself acknowledges that. See this quote. Opportunities for epidemiological studies depend on the existence of comparable population groups exposed to different levels of fluoride from drinking water. Such circumstances are difficult to find in many industrialized countries because fluoride concentrations in community water are usually no higher than 1 mg per litre of water, even when fluoride is added to water supplies as a public health measure to reduce tooth decay. So, if someone uses the paper to say very high exposure to fluoride in your drinking water may influence intelligence, then they may be using the study correctly. However, if they are claiming that the Australian government's decision to put fluoride in the drinking water is bad, then they are just trying to use a fork to eat soup. So now we can ask, would it be valid to use this study to assert that higher fluoride intakes of about 3-5 to milligrams of fluoride per litre of water negatively influences intelligence? Well, the answer is not really, and here's why. Firstly, the studies referenced were very short and didn't consider confounding variables that can influence IQ, such as education and breastfeeding. Not accounting for these will influence the validity of the results. When a meta-analysis is comprised of a number of poorly controlled studies, it is likely to result in the meta-analysis itself having weak statistical validity. The most important thing when looking at epidemiological studies is to control for the massive amount of variables that exist in everyday life. When the studies put into the analysis don't do that, you have to be skeptical of any assertions based off that analysis. Secondly, the studies used from Chinese and Iranian researchers utilized a variety of testing methods to determine intelligence and cognitive performance, and then the meta-analysis attempted to standardize all of these different methods to a single result. There are a lot of criticisms of the measure of IQ, one of the primary ones being that it doesn't actually have any real predictive powers of a person's intelligence, but rather predicts their ability to perform in one specific test. When you consider the fact the meta-analysis includes multiple different specific tests being discussed as one, it just exponentially increases the already existing problems with how reliable IQ testing is. Lastly, when you consider that the actual overall decrease in IQ amounted to 7 points and the average standard deviation of an IQ test is 15 points, it makes it very difficult to draw any significance from the results of this study. Now, that isn't to say that any time a difference occurs within the standard deviation of a given test that the result is instantaneously meaningless, but it is to say that if the result occurs within the natural standard deviation of the test and you know a multitude of confounding variables and testing protocols weren't controlled for in the analysis, as is the case with the study in question, then the results could very likely be because of one or more of these uncontrolled variables, and not the primary variable, which in this case would be fluoride ingestion. 
Now, if we bring it back to the initial claim of fluoride influencing IQ in Western civilizations, we should consider conflicting research, such as a study conducted in New Zealand involving long-term exposure of fluoride on repeated IQ testing between the ages of 7 and 13 and again at 38. The study found absolutely no link between fluoride intake and reduced IQ when external factors were controlled for. There are many rigorous studies with similar results to this that worked to build a very strong case for fluoride not influencing IQ, and one meta-analysis using a multitude of low-quality studies and not controlling for external factors is not enough to refute this body of work. In conclusion, there is a lot of evidence to suggest fluoride has a lot of positive health effects that are an important thing to include in public policy, and the claims that it negatively influences IQ are poorly supported at best. The study involving academics from Harvard does not claim to prove the link, but only outlines the possibility of a link existing in cases of high fluoride exposure. But even that claim is very weak. The authors of the paper even accept that themselves. It just seems to be the anti-fluoride crowd that can't accept it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for regular videos, like this video, and share it around to help us raise the bar of public discourse.